out the allegation and introduce the witnesses. So, over to Chris Governor. Thank you, Vinny. Um, let me just read out the allegation that we're going to face today's proceedings on. I'm asserting that by making public and private statements in support of the war with Iraq, by voting in Parliament in favour of armed action, by condoning the actions of the Prime Minister, by paying tax, by taking part in debates, by agreeing to government policies, by supporting and condoning orders to Her Majesty's Armed Forces to conduct armed attacks, and by providing assistance with the invasion and occupation of Iraq, in the certain knowledge that men, women and children would be killed, the Queen, members of Her Majesty's Government, members of both Houses of Parliament, civil servants, armed forces commanders, and others did aid, abet, counsel, and procure the commission of a crime of genocide against the Iraqi people, and as accessories to genocide, are liable to be tried, indicted, and punished as principal offenders under sections 51 and 52 of the International Criminal Court Act 2001, and Article 25 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. That's the allegation around which we want to run today's proceedings. I would like to start by thinking about the situation in Iraq. And uh, my first witness, uh, Dr. Al Bazi, uh, unfortunately can't be here today, and so I'm asking someone else to read part of his, his evidence. Now, for the full speech that Dr. Al Kubezi gave to the European Parliament, I'd refer you to page 18 of the document Accounting for Genocide. Colin, if you could uh, mark the uh, witness box, that would help. Uh, it won't be reading out the full speech, but we will be reading the effects. And the important thing about this is for us all to understand the effects that our actions have had on Iraq and the people of Iraq. And when you read the full statement, uh, it is a very moving account of the appalling situation in Iraq. So, Colin, can I leave it to you to read out the... Yeah. Yes, this is a, a brief, um, ex well, not a brief extract, but an extract from the mobile speech. So I'll just start. Um, gentlemen, members of the European Parliament, and distinguished colleagues and audience, suffice it for me to state that we are in a country that is Iraq. One, 70% of, it, of its doctors have emigrated. Two, it has lost more than 5,500 of its scientists and academics, killed, imprisoned, or emigrated. Three, 70% of its hospitals have minimum standard performance, below the required standards in the remnants of what is destroyed, raided, or stolen. Four, 90% of medicines in pharmacies is neither analyzed nor is it registered or is bad or corrupt and contaminated. It is bought onto the black market across the borders by ghost companies and a country in which thousands of unlicensed pharmacies and drug depots exist, run by people who are not pharmacists. Five, its hospitals are used as centres for ethnic and sectarian physical liquidation and terror by the militia. Six, the Ministry of Health is part of a sectarian quota division system that specifies the identity of the minister and the Directors General, and is controlled by the theocratic political parties, as well as the religious and sectarian militias. It is an institution in which financial and administrative corruption prevails, and according to the Transparency Committee, more than two billion US dollars have disappeared as a result of phony ghost contracts and bribery. So, there is no supervisory or monitoring role to be mentioned by the present parliamentarians, who are doctors, but on the contrary, their interference may cause a negative effect on the size and the nature of fi financial and administrative corruption. Eight, widespread mental illness and drug addiction 
and the widespread growth of opium poppy plantations and opium for the first time since occupation. Nine, alteration of basic medical purchase requirements and their replacement with insignificant lists and invoices. Ten, the spread of epidemics and the loss of credibility of all statistics and the lack of statistics of cholera, measles, diphtheria, and whooping cough, and toxoplasmosis, and a worsening situation of tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. 11. Unsafe imported foods. 12. A rise of incidence in cancer and the nature of the registered cases recently, and a rise in cases of congenital malformation as due to the aggravated complications as a result of radioactive pollution and the burning down of trees. Pollution of rivers as a result of the collapse of the sewage system, particularly in the middle and south, caused by the use of depleted de uranium and white phosphorus, as well as cluster bombs and prevention by the occupation forces of remedial measures and surveys to discover polluted locations for sterilization and cleansing. 13. The proliferation of landmines in the sites of the old wars, as well as exploded ordnance, especially in Basra and in the border areas. 14. Loss of cooperation and harmony with the humanitarian and voluntary organizations such as the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies and others, as well as financial corruption in the Iraqi Red Crescent Society and the escape outside Iraq of its president with US protection. 15. Lack of medicines and supplies and, as well as minimal financial allocations, since they did not exceed 4% of the overall budget allocations in the best cases, and because of rampant corruption. 16. Lack of safe portable water for more than 70% of the population, and a continuing lack of electricity, as well as the lack of proper sanitation. 17. The highest rates of infant and newborn mortality in the world. 18. In Iraq, after the occupation, first, more than 5 million are displaced. Second, more than 4 million are below poverty level. Third, approximately 2 million widows. Fourth, 5 million orphans. Fifth, insufficient food for more than 8 million. Sixth, more than 400,000 have been detained and imprisoned. Seventh, more than 28% of the population is unemployed. Uh, I'll move on to the conclusion, um, uh, with, uh, which, uh, from which it is clear <coughs> that human health and safety is being targeted as well as the Iraqi identity. Depersonalization and interference in the process of education and upbringing in order to weaken and divide Iraq by depletion of its capabilities and its scientific resources, which is being implemented by devising a political process and service institutions based on ethnic and sectarian quotas which are inconsistent with efficiency, integrity and reconstruction, transparency and construction. Distinguished members of the European Parliament, occupation, invasion, murder, terrorism, intimidation and threats would not put an end to the aggravated violence because of the worsening oppression of peoples and are just unjustified wars that do not create freedoms and democracy. All that the occupation built is a political process which it alleges to be legitimate, has proved that it is a failure, for the government of Iraq is classified as the most failed in the world, and the most financially and administratively corrupt. Thus, I urge you to work on expelling the occupation out of Iraq as soon as possible, and to allow the Iraqi people and international will to achieve genuine national reconciliation between the patriotic forces and the components of the mosaic of our people and its factions, so that it is an Iraqi solution with regional and international support, and so that it is not a forced solution as a result of force, invasion and threats. International law obliges the occupying power to pay equitable compensation for all the damage committed after the occupation while the country was under its patronage. We also hope that all those involved in all the political administrations for during the occupation be made accountable and tried for their planning for 
and execution of the invasion of Iraq without any justification. Your stance with the will and aspirations of the unified Iraqi people is required and is basic for what it expresses in its message of justice and support for all the oppressed peoples. In opposition to and the cessation of all reform wars and all occupation and imperialistic projects in the world. For they will only contribute to further violence, tension, and political and economic instability, which threaten the world today with choking crises as well as threatening the heart of humanity and the achievements of the peoples of the world. Finally, please accept from our people and ourselves words of the deepest gratitude, of thanks, and of praise, as I also ask the Justice Tribunal for helping and granting me this opportunity. And that is signed by Dr. Omar Al Kubasi uh, in Brussels, Belgium. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, I'm suggesting that we don't ask questions uh, because Dr. Kavazi is not here. So we'll move on to our next witness. Ben Griffin. can just introduce yourself to the, uh, to the court and to put it into context why you're here and why you were in Iraq. Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Griffin. Yes. I served in the British Army from 1997 until 2005. I served in Northern Ireland, uh, Macedonia, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, in 2005 I left the army after a few to continue serving alongside American forces in Iraq. And, um, so, I suppose I'm here today to give you evidence as to uh, the conduct of operations within Iraq. Um, the question being asked today, one of the questions was the Iraq war illegal? Um, well, obviously we'll come to, come to that um, decision later, but um, my point would be that the conduct of operations in Iraq were most definitely illegal. And um, we'd like to give evidence about that, um, about what we're doing. Perhaps I can ask you a couple of questions about that conduct of operations. Can you just say how long you were there and what you were involved in? Sure. Um, I was in Iraq from uh, January to April 2005. I served in a joint US-UK Special Forces unit um, in Baghdad. And uh, did you have any experience of um, your unit um, causing deaths or injuries to Iraqi civilians? I suppose maybe I should outline what, what that unit was. Um, Can you just ask your rank in, in the unit? Yeah, sure. I was a trooper in the Special Air Service. In Iraq. Um, the, the unit was a joint unit, so half US, half UK. And when I'm talking today, I'd like to also make the point that anything that was done by that unit, um, we're all, uh, the UK is jointly culpable for. Uh, anything that was done by the coalition Iraq. Uh, the UK is culpable for. Once you join into coalition with another, another country, whatever they do, you're also responsible for. So I'd like to sort of um, try not to sort of put the blame onto Americans or put the blame onto the US. It's, it's, you've, you've got to think of this as a, as a joint operation and, and the whole thing of Iraq as, as a joint operation. Um, our main task in Iraq supposedly was to uh, capture so called high value targets. Um, people that have been designated as a threat to the stability and security in Iraq, either to the Iraqi people or to the coalition forces. Um, whether those people were in fact high value targets or not is another question. And how did you um, carry out that? Uh, sure, so. Um, can you give a couple of examples? Yeah, I've just sort of run through how that would work. Um, we would get some intelligence, either from someone we captured or through paying someone. Um, paying money for this evidence. We'd be given a name or an address, and from that we start to build up an intelligence picture by carrying out surveillance on that address. Uh, once you've been told that someone is, um, you know, like an insurgent or helping the insurgency, everything they do then becomes suspicious. So over the next days or weeks, 
um, carrying out surveillance on these people. Anyone they came into contact with could also be drawn into this web of suspicion. Anything they did would become suspicious. So just normal actions like driving around that day or visiting people, in our minds would be, we, you know, we, we think the worst of them. So obviously they're going to meet this person to plan an attack, or they're digging in their garden, you know, they're not digging vegetables, they're just hiding weapons. All this, you know, this sort of suspicion, uh, suspicious way of looking at people. Um, after we built up a picture about where these people lived, where their daily movements were, and who they were associating with, it was usually going, it was usually at night, um, either driving or helicopter, and um, carry out an operation on that building. Um, we usually use explosives to get in, so we blow a hole in the, in the outer wall, blow a hole into the house, the whole house would be full of dust, and then we'd go in there and we'd be looking for certain people. We'd have pictures and names of these people that we were looking for. 